of radio. You are listening to Texas History Lessons, a small walk through Texas history made in Texas by a Texan for everyone everywhere. Welcome to Texas History Lessons. I'm Michael. And with this episode, we continue, as promised, with part two for this month in Texas history for the month of December. As I mentioned in part one, these episodes have been a lot of fun to do, and I'm also glad to have done them because by using this monthly scenario, I've learned a lot that's going to help prepare me for future lessons episodes. I've really enjoyed seeing the strings that tie Texas history together through the decades and centuries, and it's helped give me perspective, and it's helped fill in holes in my own knowledge that I did not know I had, which is why I do the podcast. By having the podcast to do, it holds me to following something and pursuing it on a regular schedule of something that I have done for my entire life, and I get to share it with y'all. So with this episode, we're going to continue our time travel back and visit with many significant events that have happened in Texas history during the month of December. In the past episode, we looked at such notable people as Vera Mendy and some other governors, Alarcon. That was uh, Alarcon was involved with the foundation of San Antonio. Vera Mendy was a governor of Texas at one point, and his daughter was married to the infamous Jim Bowie. We looked at the death of Stephen F. Austin, and we looked at the inauguration of Maribo Bonaparte Lamar, among other things that happened in December. So we're continuing on. We didn't get that far. We only made it to just after independence. So let's get on to the next step in Texas history, where the United States Congress voted to annex Texas on December 29th, 1845, after many uncertain years of whether it would happen. President Anson Jones handed over control of the government to State Governor James Pinckney Henderson on February 19th, 1846. Years later, after repeatedly being passed over by the voters of Texas for a spot in the United States Senate, Jones would kill himself in 1858 in Houston, the city named for the man he had grown to have a deep hatred for over the years. And I've been looking into some primary documents around the time of from independence to annexation and trying to dig in to get a real good feel for why Texas didn't just immediately get annexed. And it's kind of complicated, but it's not that complicated. And slavery did play an important role. A lot of people, especially in Great Britain, as far as it came to giving recognition to Texas as being an independent nation, they had a problem with it because of the slavery issue. But there are other items also involved, and we'll get into that sometime. December 15th. 1855 was the day that the 2nd United States Cavalry Regiment arrived in Texas for the first time, having been created by Congress for the specific purpose of protecting the Texas frontier. Secretary of War Jefferson Davis had handpicked several of its officers, and the 2nd Cavalry eventually produced 16 general officers. Half of the Confederate Army's generals came from the 2nd Cavalry and Robert E. Lee's last command in the United States Army at the time of secession was with the 2nd Cavalry and he was in Texas at the time of secession. And he was also in command of 2nd Cavalry, I believe, at the time this next event occurred but we're going to take a break I'm going to play a song from Rosemond Mondo Salas' band Old Dogs 
and thank Age of Radio for hosting Texas History Lessons. And we're going to get back and look at an event that did involve the Second Cavalry. If the water in the rivers were to dry, would you take me to where they hide? If the angels hardly made it in heaven, would you sing me a lullaby? Built to run on the road or come from a kind. It's never been nobody and we keep trying to live but all we find It's hard times and old dogs again for sharing his music with me so that I can share it with y'all. Be sure to support him on Spotify or wherever you listen to music. But let's get back to why we're really here. Texas history. As I said before the break, the Second Cavalry was in Texas to protect the frontier. Now, they're going to be involved in this next date. One of the most famous stories in Texas history is that of the Parker family's loss of young Cynthia Ann Parker when Comanches attacked them at their Limestone County home, Fort Parker, in 1836. You can visit the site today at Fort Parker State Park. It's a little bit under an hour east of Waco or about two hours from the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex or from the Austin area, about similar time difference. Now, if you're familiar with that event, then you are also probably aware that young Cynthia Ann spent close to the next 25 years of her life with the Comanches. 
marrying a man named Peta Nokona, and they had three children. One of them was named Quana, and he also became a significant part of Texas history and legend by being one of the last Comanches to lead his people to life on the reservation at Fort Sill in Indian Territory in the 1870s. Now, when Quana did arrive at Fort Sill in the mid-1870s, one of the very first things he did was inquire on the whereabouts of his mother and younger sister. Because you have probably also heard of the Battle of Peace River, where on December 18, 1860, the intrepid ranger captain Saul Ross killed Chief Peta Nakona and rescued Cynthia Ann Parker. Saul Ross used the event to build a political career. Now that's one way of looking at the story. That's a story that's been passed down. Then there's what really happened. Now for a more complete understanding of what really happened and how the story got appropriated for other purposes and changed, we can give thanks to historian Paul H. Carlson and former state district judge and West Texas Historical Association president Tom Crum. So about a year ago, I was looking for some information on the Comanches and came across a video of Dr. Carlson giving a presentation at an event. And the subject title of the presentation was Did Quana Parker Lie? You can still go find this video. It's on YouTube. Just look up Did Quanta Parker Lie, Dr. Carlson, or Car Paul H. Carlson, Did Quanta Parker Lie. After watching that, I was pretty fascinated with how he presented it. This is a historian showing how historians go about their work. He had spent, he spent his entire career working in this subject matter. So I went and found a copy of the book that Carlson and Crum had researched and written on the event. And the name of the book is Myth, Memory, and Massacre, The Peace River Capture of Cynthia Ann Parker. Now I'm going to do my best to summarize their work here and we'll return for a more complete look at what happened in the future. But this is just going to be a summary of their findings and what happened that fateful day in December. I mean, heck, Carlson Crum researched and revealed that it wasn't even on the 18th that the fight happened. It was December 19th, and it wasn't a battle, and it wasn't on the Peace River. And while many call it a rescue, Carlson Crum, I feel justifiably call it a capture. I agree with that. The poor woman had the misfortune of being captured twice and forcibly removed from her families. The first time was when she was a young child in 1836 when her family was brutally attacked by the Comanches and she was forcibly removed. And the second time was when her adopted Comanche family was brutally attacked and she was forcibly removed from them. After living with the Comanches for almost a full quarter century, little Cynthia Ann Parker had become Nada, or Nadua. She was a Comanche wife and a Comanche mother. She had three children, Quana, Pecos, and Topsana. Very little of that young girl living at Parker's Ford in 1836 remained. She identified with the people, the Numina, and her life and identity was fully ingrained in that life. Had she actually been rescued whilst she was still a child, everything obviously would have been different. And this entire subject of what captives underwent is a fascinating one, and it's a hard one to look at. And there's a lot of good books out there and research that's been given, but we'll get into that at another time. It's an entire number of episodes. But I 
believe me, I don't take it lightly. I'm not justifying what the Comanches did ever. But what happened on this day also was pretty hard to take. Now, I live in northwest Texas, which is an area that's roughly defined as west of Fort Worth, north of modern Interstate Highway 20, and east of the 100th Meridian, and of course the Red River's on the north. It now includes much territory in about 20 counties, including starting up on the Red River, Montague, Clay, Wichita, Willbarger, Hardeman, and then starting back east again and going west, you got Wise, Jack, Archer, Young, Baylor, Throckmorton, Ford, Knox, Haskell, Palo Pinto, which is a beautiful area, Stevens, Shackleford, Jones, and Callahan counties. And it's arguable that you should include parts of Cook, Dallas, and Tarrant counties, of course, as being considered part of Northwest Texas. Now, this is an old term that I, at least I don't hear much anymore. You hear of North Texas. You hear of West Texas. There's the Panhandle. But Northwest Texas is a term I first really heard about from history books and the way historians have used to describe an area that was the northwest edge of Texas settlement in the mid-19th century. It was a hotly contested area, and settlement moved slowly into it. It wasn't until the mid to late 1850s that settlers really made serious attempts to push into the eastern edges of this very large area. And then the Civil War halted even that. Why it was so important was that, as Carlson and Crum perfectly state in the book, and I quote, before the 1850s, Northwest Texas was a mobile hunting society's paradise. In some ways, it was a private hunting preserve of the Comanches and any guests they might indulge, end quote. And the guests would have been any of their friends, including the Wichita's or the Kiowas, of course. So when the Texas settlers started moving into the area with their cattle and farms, settlers that included men that we've talked about, like Oliver Loving and Charles Goodnight, the Comanches naturally saw a threat to their hunting preserve, their way of life, their livelihood, and raids commenced. There were other reasons that we'll get into in the future that had to do with other issues that called for the raids as well. But we'll get into that. It's a deeper issue than just the desire to inflict violence. And the Texas settlers, of course, felt justified in protecting themselves and called for aid. They saw this as a land of opportunity, just like the Comanches did, and they both wanted to control it. Now, this is all going to be a highly shortened version of what happened, even though it doesn't probably seem like it at the moment. But to suffice it to say that the event that we talked about, the arrival of the 2nd United States Cavalry, coincides with the event of December 1860. In late November of 1860, about 55 warriors of uh, no Coney Comanche Band slipped past Texas defenses and traveled through Jack, Parker, and Palo Pinto counties. And from November 26th to the 28th, they stole about 300 horses, killed about six settlers, stole or destroyed whatever items they wanted. They scalped two women and took captives. Three captives, I believe, to be exact. Two were released at some point or escaped, and one died. Now, of course, people were infuriated and in fear. Citizens formed an ill-prepared militia to go out in the field and exact justice. Sol Ross, who had already started making a name for himself with the Rangers, he established a Ranger camp near Fort Belknap, near modern-day Newcastle in Young County, and Sergeant John W. Spangler arrived with 20 troopers of Company H, 2nd Cavalry, from Fort Cooper, which was to the west of Fort Belknap. They moved out on December 14, 1860, 
Spangler leading the 20 cavalry and Ross leading about 40 rangers. And Charles Goodnight, one of our favorites to talk about, was president and served as a scout on the mission. On December 19th, 1860, Spangler and Ross found a small Noconi hunting camp on Mule Creek, a few miles up it from the Peace River. Spangler maneuvered his cavalry to block the retreat while Ross and about 20 of his rangers rushed in and attacked the camp. There were nine dwellings, and at the time, there were probably about 15 Comanches, and they were all already preparing to depart. Some were already on horseback, and it's believed that some of them did escape. And it's also rumored that Spangler actually let some of them escape because most of them were women and children. And what happened after that was um, it's hard to, it's hard to come up with an actual body count because there are differing reports. In less than 30 minutes, the attack, the, quote, battle was over. Ross claimed that they had killed 12 and captured 3. Spangler reported 12 killed and 3 captured. They also captured about 40 Indian ponies, and like I said, they had 3 captives, a boy and a woman with an infant daughter. It was a massacre, not a battle. One of the men there, Texas Ranger Hiram B. Rogers, stated in 1928 that he had been at the fight, but was not, and I quote, very proud of it. That was not a battle at all, but just a killing of, in his term, squaws, end quote. Ross adopted the boy that they captured and named him Peace Ross. Uh, but the woman's identity remained unknown for some time. And what Carlson and Crum find out is Pettinokona was not there and was not killed by Ross or anyone else there. He wasn't there. Nor were, we don't, we believe, Pecos and Quano. Don't believe that they were there. Eventually, the woman was identified by, I think, an uncle as Cynthia Ann Parker. And, but she wanted to return to her family, her Comanche family. But she spent the rest of her life with her Parker family. The baby girl, Topsana Prairie Flower, died a few years later. Nauda, or Nadua, Cynthia, lived with one family member than another, dying around 1870, 1871, and she was buried where she was living at the time in Anderson County. And Quanta, like I said, he went from 1860, about 15 years, wondering what ever happened to his mother. He eventually found out, after reaching Fort Sill, that his mother and sister were dead. And eventually was successful at having their remains brought to be buried near where he was living, and then he was buried with near them there were all their remains were eventually moved and today if you visit Fort Sill in Oklahoma you can visit the graves of Quana, Cynthia and Nauda and Topsana it's hard to miss because out of this very large graveyard filled with distinguished military and also other Native Americans Kiowa and Comanche leaders were buried there Quana's memorial is the most obvious one it dwarfs everything and there, next to his towering memorial, are the graves of Cynthia Ann and Topsana Prairie Flower. Now, I want to quote something from Carlson and Crumb's book. History and legend often mix. The mixing, writes folklorist B.A. Botkin, has given rise to a large body of unhistorical traditions and the enactment of doubtful events by historical characters. George Washington did not cut down a cherry tree. William Barrett Travis did not draw a line in the sand at the Alamo. Art, literature, film, and folklore perpetuate many falsehoods or gray areas. Because I'm not saying when I talk about the myth of Texas, in myth, 
there's a lot of foundation of it is in truth. And but the the Battle of Peace River, where Sol Ross killed Chief Peyton O'Kona and rescued Cynthia Ann Parker, it didn't happen in the glorious way that he described it in order to get elected political office. In fact, even his own ch story changed over time. And another error that I've made, the Lano Estacado, the Stake Plains, I, I've called it myself many times. I've mentioned in the recent episodes, they were never really meant to be called the Stake Plains. No matter how many times you see Stake Plains, as I have on 19th century maps, it was a mistranslation of the original Spanish. It should be called the Palisaded or Stockaded Plains because that is what they look like as the great historian on this subject matter, Herbert E. Bolton wrote in his book on Coronado, they were called the stockaded plains from the rim rock, which at a distance looked like a stone fortification. And I had come across that, and I should have remembered that and shared that. But the word stake plains have been repeated over so much and is included in so many pieces of historical writing I slipped into using it myself. But what's the point of sidestepping into this? The point is that it's important to be careful. And even when being careful, mistakes can be made. But when they are made, they must be acknowledged. And as the This Month in Texas History episodes come to an end, I intend to keep that information, that idea, close to heart. As we advance into the early history of Texas and that of Spain and her overseas empire of New Spain, my goal is always to be as careful as possible, to be in, as complete and thorough as possible as I can be. But I will always acknowledge mistakes that I make when I make them. But before we end this episode, let's summarize some more important events that occurred in December Following Texas' accession from the United States and the Second Cavalry's withdrawal from Texas, Texans on the edge of settlement were increasingly fearful of continued raids. I live in a county that I have some of the, read some of the actual histories, early histories written by, uh, about that period of time, and they were constantly afraid of what was going to happen without any military there to protect them. And this, again, is another controversial area in what the relationship between the Confederate government and the state of Texas. And there were different opposing views between the two about what the armed men should be allowed to do. Should the state of Texas keep be able to keep their armed men here to protect Texas, or should they all be sent to fight for the Confederate Army? Like, again, I'm oversimplifying it, but that is something that we're going to have to look into and that also ties into the great hanging in Gainesville, Texas that we have mentioned before. But there was it was a time of fear. In fact, there were places where during the Civil War, the line of frontier, the, the line of settlement drew back up to 100 miles in places. To attempt to alleviate these fears, if not to end all the raids, the Texas State Legislature created the Frontier Regiment to patrol west of the settlements from the Red to the Rio Grande in December. December 5th marks the birthday of legendary black cowboy Bill Pickett in Travis County in 1870, and he is credited with creating bulldogging, what evolved into steer wrestling in modern-day PRCA rodeo. December 10th is the day that the great Dan Blocker was born in 1928 in DeKalb, Texas. If you don't recognize the name, many of you would definitely recognize his picture, and you'll know his name of Hoss Cartwright, the character, the memorable gentle giant character he played on Bonanza from 1959 until his death in 1972. And last, we're going to close out with the great Texas historian Herbert P. Gambrell, a native of Tyler, Texas, who died on December 30th, 1982. Born in 1892, 
He had a long career teaching at Southern Methodist University. And I like the statement and quote provided by the Handbook of Texas concerning him, so I'm going to share that. Quote, his life embodied his creed that only an autocratic government can afford to have historically ignorant citizens. It is a luxury we cannot afford. And that is an important thing to remember and apply. So that's it for this month in Texas history for December. That's it for this month in Texas history. It probably will end up returning in another form from time to time. And as I mentioned last episode, after starting releasing Texas History Lessons August 2020, this makes my second December. And through all the months, I've learned a lot about how to make the podcast, try to make it better. I've made mistakes, but I always try to keep improving and fixing that so I don't make as many mistakes. More importantly, I've learned a lot about the history of Texas and beyond. It's been a great experience personally. And I hope that some of y'all have shared in the joy and knowledge that I've had from researching and recording this podcast. Most importantly, like I mentioned last episode, I've met some great and supportive people that share in my love for history and the stories that I've learned and shared. First of all are my Patreon supporters. These are people to whom I'm very indebted because while I'm not, and I'll admit it, I'm not good at providing additional benefits through Patreon. Heck, I'm barely able to get out two episodes a month. But I am work hard to try to do it. And I do it out of love of sharing and learning. But they care enough to lend me their support on Patreon out of love of history and belief in the mission of the show. So again, thank you deeply to Jay and Ron, two wonderful men that I do know personally and have the greatest respect for. And Jay has given me some sound advice, as has Ron, and inspired me to keep going, especially early on when I first started the podcast. Uh, Some things Jay told me meant a lot and helped me keep going. I want to thank Kay, Brenda, and Rayma. I want to say thanks to Tim Sider and Josh, two really good historians in their own rights and in their own ways. And I'm looking forward to great things from both of them. Thanks to Johnny, who would probably prefer listening to a podcast in New Mexico, but he still supports Texas History Lessons. New Mexico will be featured prominently in the future, though, because it had an important role in the development of Texas. And special thanks to Indy, the newest Patreon supporter, who recently moved to the state and started listening to the podcast to learn more about his new home. Special episode is in the works for him, just for him, about the city he lives in. Thanks to all of you for your support. I hope someday to have some special things to offer y'all in the future on Patreon. Along the way, I've heard some great support from other people that have just reached out with words of encouragement and comments. A lot of teachers listen to this podcast, and that floors me. I can't believe that. The fact that I am in some way a little bit helpful with them is something that I, I, I feel very good about. Now, as I said last time, there's probably no way I can remember everybody that's given me support. I wish I could. But I did better this time around than I did last time. So thanks to Sam Pareto, Twinkle Johnson, Dan Stevens, Dean Vinson, Freddie Martinez Morales, Chuck Sims, Sergio Gonzalez, Adrian, Patricia, Layla, BJ, Cesar Inahosa, and John Eric Vandegrift, who listens while he dredges the Texas coast. Said I'd remember it. He promises to update me if he finds anything historically significant someday besides old beer cans. And I hope he does someday. <laughs> Pulls up something really awesome. Many of you are teachers, and knowing that I've been able to help you means a lot. But all of your supportive comments and encouragement have been very important. As usual, I want to recommend some podcasts for your listening pleasure. As always, go check out Josh on the Wild West Extravaganza and David on the History Cafe podcast. Both shows are excellent. Both offer something different and special, but they both put in a lot of work 
takes a lot of work to do the level of quality that they do on their shows. And while I rarely mention it, because I assume if you love Texas history, you're already listening to Judge Ken Wise's Wise About Texas. But if you don't, you have to go check him out. He embodies, along with these other gentlemen I mentioned, everything I've been stressing about, what it means to share good researched history. You won't be disappointed by him or any of them. For music lovers, you have an abundance of Texas music podcasts to choose from. I recommend Chris Rev Waterman's Hymns of the Highway, Aaron Lee Bentley's Off Mic, Off the Record, and Blake Farrar's Texas River Tonk, a podcast that actually originates as a radio show in San Marcos on KZSM. And Blake and I both love Louis L'Amour, so we got that going together. Each of these shows, they have great interviews, and they share great music, and each is different enough to where you don't feel like you're listening to the same thing over and over. Even if they have the same people on, they both are able to have a different discussion, and they just I encourage them to keep doing what they're doing. And last but not least, of course, are the Texas History Lesson Spotlight artist. Jared Flushy was the first to be kind enough to let me share his music, and I encourage y'all to listen to his songs and look forward to the future when he finally does put some more music out himself right now he's on the road with a really great band Giovanni and the Hired Guns so I want to thank him for his participation in the podcast and like I said what can I say about Mondo Salas and Rosemond there's so much depth and talent and feeling in the songs this man records He's a great, talented artist, and in the interactions I've had with him, he's so kind it's hard to explain. And he's also funny as heck. Man, if you follow him on social media, he'll keep you laughing all day long. And as long as he allows it, I'm going to always share his music, like the song I played earlier at the break, Old Dogs. And as we move forward, we will be hearing from other wonderful artists. And, um, yeah, that's it. That's it. Goodbye 2021. Goodbye December. Looking forward to next year. Getting into some more episodes. Being researched. And I'm, I haven't been lying. I've been researching and writing for, for all year long on these other things that I'm trying to get into. This week, we're going to have another song by Zach Welch. Followed by a song by Tristan Sanchez. And I'm probably going to add a couple more since the end of the year. I'm just going to like, why not? Why not play a song by everybody that I've mentioned uh, that's participated in are now each Texas History Lesson Spotlight artist. I hope to share music from all of them in the future. But um, thanks to all of you for listening. Thanks, everybody. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. Be kind. Adios. I ain't never placed the blame anywhere it don't belong And I've strived to be the kind of man who knows his right from wrong I don't hold no grudges, you hate me, I wish you well But I won't change a thing for you, sorry baby, I ain't for sale Cause I'm a scumbag, scumbag. It don't hurt my feelings, none, I'm a scumbag, scumbag. Hell, I guess that means you're done, well, I'm a scumbag, scumbag. Well, you Lessons is the best way we can grow I remember hearing you would be the best I ever had But I won't lie to you, darling This new life ain't half bad Cause I'm a scumbag Scumbag. It don't hurt my feelings none I'm a scumbag Scumbag. Hell, I guess this means you're done Well, I'm a scumbag Scumbag. Why you walking out the door? Cause I'm a scumbag Cause I don't need you anymore
Some things should be kept to yourself according to my mother But I'm an open book, I wear my heart there on the cover And there's too much fun left to be to just lay around and cry And I keep on getting stronger cause I'm too damn mean to die Cause I'm a scumbag Scumbag I don't hurt my feelings none I'm a scumbag Scumbag Hell, I guess that means you're done Well, I'm a scumbag Scumbag Well, you're walking out the door I'm a scumbag And you're just a four I don't get dreams no more The longer I lay The more that I feel afraid The emptiness inside Is worse than the day you said goodbye And I And I can't deal anymore
Listening to this right now. Thank you for listening all the way through. It means a lot to us. Yeah, that wasn't terrible. That was pathetic. Boom.